Welcome, my friends and family, to WBC's first online worship service. I hope you enjoyed that walkthrough we had a few minutes ago. Um, that piano playing was from uh, Kelly Evans, Jamie's sister, who, when she found herself in lockdown uh, this past week, immediately started to produce music for churches, and we get to benefit from that, so I hope you enjoyed it. This week has been strange. The past two weeks have been very strange. Um, I hope you're doing well. I've talked to a lot of you. I'm going to talk to a lot of you more in these next couple of weeks. I look forward to hearing uh, how you're doing, how your families are doing. And I, I hope it's all going well with you. One bit of news from the Hinchel family is Emma this week literally learned how to ride a bike from start to, I don't know if we can say finish, but she is blazing trails in the way that her mother and I are particularly worried. She just zooms off down the street um, and we can't even catch her. So that's some um, good and frightful news uh, coming from the Hinchel family. Um, I hope y'all are, are uh, sharing in similar moments uh, in your families as well. Um, I know there are some prayer requests that we have coming in. We'll get to those in a minute. But to start, I just wanted to, to say, to give you a little bit of the, the, the text that has really been keeping me going uh, throughout this time. It's Psalm 46, verses 1 through 2. Let me read it to you. God, the psalmist says, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Therefore, we will not fear. Friends, that's the thing that we can put our hope in. That's exactly what we can trust at this moment in our lives, which is so strange and sometimes so scary, that we don't have a God who is off and aloof, but a God who is very present in whom we can trust. And so we do not have to fear. This is the Lord we said during our Daniel series, the Lord of history, the Lord of history. So this doesn't mean that this Lord of history caused the coronavirus or that he likes what it is doing, but it does mean that he can in the midst of this, is working to heal us and to help us heal others. So this morning, I am, I'd like us to begin in prayer, uh, to enter into worship, um, to invite this God who is actively amongst us, helping us in this time, to come into this space, into our shared spaces this morning, and bring us once again into the body that is WBC. Will you pray with me? God, who is with us, we thank you for sending your son to us as a reminder that you are a God who suffers with us compassionately and who, whose life, death, and resurrection, we are empowered to do the same. Guide us this morning by your word and your Holy Spirit so that in your light, we might see light and in your truth, we might find freedom. And in your will, we might truly discover peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I like to begin our time together this week a little bit differently than how we normally do on Sunday mornings when we're able to all gather together. I like us to begin by hearing each other's prayers. By hearing each other's prayers. I know it's frustrating. It's frustrating for me. It's frustrating for my family. Marty has no idea why we can't go places. It's frustrating to be under lockdown, to be isolated. So much of the Christian life is, is based upon this face-to-face -face communal contact. We're a community. We're one body under one Lord and one baptism serving together. So it's hard to be apart. Hard to be apart. So I've asked for this service a number of our deacons to share with us from their own spaces um, your prayers, and then later on to share with us the scripture. So to begin, I'll just ask Julia Grant um, if she'll go ahead and speak to us the prayers that have come in this week so that we can pray for them together. For Autumn and Chris Amick's baby and the good checkup, still pray that everyone continues to look good. For Liza Sonnenberg, who is recovering from a kidney infection. For Brandon Jones' mother, Pam Jones, who is continuing to recover from pneumonia 
and the coronavirus continue to heal her and protect her family. For David Argo's brother, who began cancer treatment this past Tuesday, help him endure and see clear and complete elimination of his tumor. For Paul Kroger, Dick and Jean Dudgeon's son-in-law, father, who was admitted into hospice this week. For Bob Salmon's health and comfort as he waits for a safer time to receive surgery. For Kathleen Wise and her dog Lulu, who are finally getting to drive back today. For Dr. Philip Kennedy, the son of a friend of John and Jan Sears, who has tested positive for the coronavirus, and for his wife Amanda, who is two months pregnant, and their daughter Laura Lee, who is two years old. Thank you, Julia. Let us pray for these, as well as for our church and for our world. Will you pray with me? A good and loving God, thank you for loving us and for living through us. Make it so that everything we do this week is holy because it flows out of a deep oneness with you and with one another. Help us become the very definition of community. Friends who are willing to get vulnerable, to share each other's burdens, to bear the weight of glory, which is both heavy and yet good. We ask that you hear our prayers this morning for our church, for our neighbors, and for our world. We pray for Autumn and Chris Amex. We thank you that they had a good checkup on their baby. We pray for Liza Sonnenberg, who's still recovering from a kidney infection. We pray for Brandon Jones's mother, Pam Jones, who is continuing to recover miraculously, actually, in some ways, from pneumonia and the coronavirus. We ask that you continue to heal her and protect her family, especially Brandon's family. We pray for David Argo's brother, who began cancer treatment this past Tuesday. We ask that you help him to endure and to see clear and complete elimination of his tumor. We pray for Paul Kroger, Dick and Dean Judgeon's son-in-law's father, who is admitted into hospice this week. We pray, for, we pray for his peace. We pray also for Bob Sammons, his health and comfort as he waits for, like so many others, for a safer time to receive the surgery that he needs. And we pray for Kathleen Wise and her dog Lulu, who are finally getting to drive back home today, this Sunday. We pray for Philip Kennedy, who is the son of John and Jan Sears, who's tested positive for COVID-19. Philip is a, a doctor, and we thank him for, for what he's done for us and for his sacrifice. We pray for his wife, Amanda, who is two months pregnant, and their daughter, Lorelai, who is two years old. We pray that you protect them and keep them safe. We pray for all who are struggling with isolation today, especially those with limited numbers of friends and family. For our families, our parents, and their children who are experiencing school, maybe for the first time at home, we pray for patience and imagination and a whole lot of grace. We pray for the families of those who are hospitalized and yet who cannot visit each other. We pray for the physical, the mental, the spiritual health of all of our families and our friends and our neighbors who are walking the same strange path with us. We pray for the continued wisdom and health of the leaders of our governments around the world who are working to bring an entire, an entire whole world, planet, through a crisis. We thank you for the sacrifices of our first responders, of our doctors, our nurses, the people at the grocery counter. And we pray for their health and their determination. We thank you for the life and work of the church here in Wyoming and Cincinnati and across this world. And we pray that you would continue to show us how to be a source of hope and a source of life to those who are hurting around us. We pray for protection and healing for all people and peoples around the world, especially for those who are most vulnerable, those who suffer without access to quality health care or even the capacity to quarantine like we do. And finally, God, we pray for all those who have died this past week because of this virus. We pray that you would receive them into your open arms of love. 
We ask these things, all these things that we prayed for in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who suffered and died and rose again for us, and who taught us at one time how to pray, saying, and if you'll repeat with me the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In 2 Timothy 3, uh, we're told that scripture has the power to teach us to show us where we've gone wrong, to correct us, to simply make us into better people. As the scriptures are read this morning, I, I invite you to close your eyes, to let them sink in, to meditate them on a little bit. And then when they're done, we're going to come back together and we'll talk about them. The first reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 6 through 11. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give you life for your mortal bodies, also through his Spirit that dwells in you. The second reading is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, Let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you want to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light in this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us all go, so that we may die with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Simon. The story of Lazarus is what we call a sign. John gives us seven signs, seven of them in his gospel. They're all meant, he says. They're all meant to help us believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so that in believing, we might finally be able to experience true life in his name. That's a really complex claim, though. Just what does it mean, first of all, to be the Messiah? Or even to be the Son of God? And what does John mean not only by life, but life in Jesus' name? 
That's a bit of what these signs, like the story of Lazarus, we just heard are supposed to answer. You'll probably recognize, actually, a few of these other signs. In chapter 2, one of the worst things that can ever happen at a wedding happens. They run out of wine. They run out of wine. But for John, for John, he sees this as the perfect opportunity, the perfect opportunity to show just how powerful Jesus really is. And John does it by reminding us that Jesus can create things in a way that, that really only God can. Jesus takes some jars, he fills them with water, and voila, they become wine. He'll do the same sort of thing in chapter 6 when he feeds 5,000 people with just five fish and two loaves. And then again, a little bit later, when he walks on water, these are the signs. These are the signs that Jesus has a power over creation that only God would seem to have. But if, if those signs are Jesus showing that he's got the power of a creator God, there are some signs in John that show that he's got God's healing touch too. These are just as important for helping people believe, John says, you see, in chapter 4, we're given a story about a time, a time when Jesus was virtually tackled by this royal official. He might have been Roman, he might have been Jewish, we don't really know. But this official begs Jesus to heal his son, and Jesus, Jesus does it right then and there. He's miles away from this kid and just snaps his finger, and all of a sudden, the kid's well. All of a sudden, he's well. In the next chapter, Jesus runs to a guy who isn't just sick. He's lame for 38 years. He can't walk. All he's been doing is waiting around um, a pool, a miracle pool of sorts, hoping somebody would just have the, the mere kindness, the, the, the simplest kindness, to lift him into the water so that he could be healed. What do you expect that Jesus does? He tells him to stand up. Stand up. And once again, he's healed just like that. In chapter 9, though, we get what would have been considered something even more difficult, something virtually impossible. John has Jesus not only heal somebody who became ill, he tells us a story about Jesus healing somebody who was born that way, who was born blind, a blind man born from birth without the ability to see. The idea of this seems to be that God was the one that made him that way. And nobody can unmake what God makes. Nobody but God can undo what God does. But Jesus unmakes that blindness. He heals this man's blindness by spitting on the ground and making some mud and then rubbing it all over the guy's face. This story has echoes all over it of Genesis 2, the creation story, all over it. God forms Adam out of the dust of the ground and he breathes his own life into him. Jesus here with the blind man is doing the same thing. He's doing the same thing. So by the time, by the time we get to the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11, we've been prepped. We've been prepped to expect something even bigger, something even more amazing than just Jesus healing more and more serious cases of people who are sick and dying. And guess what? John doesn't disappoint. In the part of this story we just heard, Lazarus has fallen ill. He's sick. And Jesus is told by this messenger sent by Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha. We get the impression that Mary and Martha were, were asking Jesus to hurry up. Come. Come in a hurry. But what does he do? Instead, he actually waits longer. He waits longer than he normally would have. This illness does not lead to death, he says. It does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross once described the five stages of grief as these, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally, acceptance. Acceptance. Maybe what we have right here in Jesus's statement is him in denial. Maybe it's him being unwilling to come to terms with the fact that the one that he loves, as the text says, this one's going to die. I mean, we know he could have healed Lazarus from right there, from that very spot where you were standing in, like he did the royal official son we just talked about. Jesus could have done it, but he doesn't. Instead, he waits. 
Instead, he delays. He lets the situation brew until two days later when he finally decides head to head back to Bethany and Judea where Lazarus is and where Murray and Martha are waiting. He gets there too late. And that seems to have been his plan all along. And this is when we get one of those lines that explains the point of all these signs of John's gospel that we have to pay attention to. And here's what Jesus says. He says, Lazarus is dead. He tells his disciples, Lazarus is dead, but for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. For your sake, I was glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Belief, as I like to say, isn't really an intellectual thing. That's part of it, of course. But the heart of belief in the Bible is really trust. It's trust. Trust is a thing of the will. It's a thing of the will. It's like if Jesus had said, but for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you might finally, finally decide to trust me. Finally come to the place where you can trust me. Trust me. So trust is a thing of the will. It might even be what we call a thing of the gut, a thing of the gut. It's related more to the kind of relationship you build, walking around with each other and growing in ways more and more dependent upon one another than it is on the mere acceptance of fact. That's why when someone breaks, when someone breaks our trust, it feels like they've, they've abandoned us, like they've left, left us out in the cold. But I trusted you, we say. It's almost an unconscious thing to trust like that. So when, when Jesus, when he finally gets to Bethany, Mary, not Mary, sorry, Martha, Martha runs out to meet him and her trust, her trust, we can say, is on the line. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me now to John chapter 11, verses 17 through 45. We're past the part that uh, Simon just read a few minutes ago, and we're moving into the next part of the story. Here's how it goes. When Jesus, the text says, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and to Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Whatever you ask of him. There's no real telling what Lazarus truly meant to Martha and to Mary. It seems obvious, of course, that they loved him, but we hear nothing about them having a father. We hear nothing about Martha and Mary having husbands, or if they had anybody else in the world who would take care of them if Lazarus died. In that day and age, it seems most likely that Lazarus had become the patriarch of his family, and Mary and Martha were included in that, and that he held the property and was the main person providing for their livelihood, their subsistence. So what would happen to them now that he was dead? All of this is going on. And Jesus, Martha says, could have fixed it. He could have fixed it all. Lord, if you had been here, if you had just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And they had trusted him to come, but he had waited. He had delayed. They had remembered Jesus' earlier signs. We needed to heal folks who had been just as close to death as Lazarus had been. They knew he could do it, but he didn't. But he didn't. I get the feeling, I get the feeling about Martha that she's passing here through that anger stage and into this into this bargaining stage of grief, the, the, the five stages that we talked about, she's angry with Jesus for not coming soon enough, maybe for not even caring enough. But she's willing to, to risk one more bit of hope. She's willing to bargain. Maybe it's all she's got left. But even now, she says, even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Can you fix this, Jesus? Can you fix this too? Jesus says, he can. Your brother will rise again, he tells her. But that's not really what she's looking for. I know that he will rise again, she says, in the resurrection on the last day. But what about now, she seems to think. What about, what about now? Jesus, can you, can you do anything about this tragedy now? 
What about today? Her question is a real one. Honestly, it's the question I think we all want to ask when things like this happen, when we lose loved ones, uh, when they're suffering. In fact, it's no doubt the question that a whole bunch of people around the world um, have been asking a lot in these past couple of weeks, especially um, people who have family and friends in the hospital and they cannot visit them. The future is simply too far away right now to give us much hope for the struggles and the pains of the present. Honestly, let me ask you this. Have you ever had somebody come up to you in the middle of some real moment of grief or tragedy or suffering in your life and tell you, it's just going to get better, I promise? Or don't worry, things will all turn out for the best. To me, I think those two lines especially are some of the worst things you can say to anyone in the middle of a crisis or in the middle of grieving over the loss of a loved one. And this is where Mary is at right now. She wants to know if Jesus can do anything for her brother now. Her answer, yeah, I know he will rise on the last day, is 100% absolutely correct. We can't deny that Jesus is going to rise, raise us up on the last day. That's what Jesus is going to do. But he also says that's not all that resurrection means. It's not just something in the far off future. It's something for us now, he says. I am and the resurrection and the life, he says. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who believes and lives in me will never die. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans 8, our other passage for today. He says, but if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also. This is a super interesting passage because for Paul, the notion of a future resurrection here in Romans 8 is as much an aside as it is anything else. It's in the periphery. The future is in the periphery. His focus is not on a future resurrection. It's on present resurrection. It's on present resurrection life right now. Just listen to how he puts things only a few verses earlier. He says, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. We often offer up eternal life and the resurrection of the dead as incentive for folks to believe in Jesus. But both Paul and Jesus are saying that resurrection means even more than that. Resurrection, the experience of real life and real peace, they can happen now, they say, right here today in the midst, in the midst of, in the midst of this virus. In the midst of a tanking economy, in the midst of loneliness and grief, resurrection life can happen, and it can happen because the Spirit of God dwells within us, because we believe, as John would say. The ending to Lazarus' story is a sign that Jesus has power even over death. In verse 38, he walks down to Lazarus' tomb. He sees that it's covered by this big stone, and he tells the people that are around to roll the stone away, and Martha chimes in, oh, practical, always mispractical Martha says, Lord, you might not want to do that because already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Death, it seems, has already made its rounds. It's all that's, all that's left after that is just the, the aftermath, the stench, Martha says. But this is no problem for Jesus. Did I not tell you, he says, that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Do you trust me, Martha? Do you trust me? Do you really believe I'm the resurrection and the life? So they took away the stone, the text goes on, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. And then Jesus cries out, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus does. The, Lazarus, the resurrection of Lazarus 
is the sign to cap off all the other signs in the book of John. It caps them all off. Not only can Jesus heal a boy close to death, not only can he fix someone who has been lame for 38 years, not only can he give sight to somebody who has been born blind, but Jesus can raise the dead. Jesus can resurrect. But you see, there's even more to this story. The sign is even bigger than that. Even bigger than that. I think that if we only look in this one direction, if we only look at this story as having to do with the physical life of Lazarus and nothing more than that, then we're going to miss a whole lot about what makes Jesus so worth trusting, so worth believing in. If we, if we think back through this story about Lazarus, it becomes pretty clear that it's not just simply a story about Lazarus or about his death. It's about other people's experiences of Lazarus's death. It's about Jesus's power to heal and to bring life and peace to these other people too. It's about Mary and Martha. It's about the people who would come to mourn with them. And maybe even more surprisingly in this text, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus's own emo emotions. It's about his own grief and his own desire for life and for peace. When Jesus saw Mary weeping, we're told in verse 33, when he saw her weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved, the text says. He asks, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then what do we hear? But Jesus began to weep. Jesus began to weep. He finally made it to that point in those stages of grief to where he accepted that his friend, his loved one, had died. He finally accepted that and everything that it meant, and he weeps. What the resurrection of Lazarus means in this bigger context is not just the promise of future life, but the promise of life and the promise of peace right here and right now, as Paul says. Because we're all partakers of that same spirit of God who raised Lazarus from the dead. There's an old, old tradition about Lazarus that says that after he was resurrected, he had this fire lit under him. He was thankful just to be alive, and he lived like it each and every day. One story has him becoming the Bishop of Marseille in France. Another has him becoming the leader of the church on the island of Cyprus. The point is not where Lazarus ended up, but that the sheer, the sheer experience he had of resurrection life made him unsatisfied with simply living to die another day. He couldn't just go on surviving. Lazarus had to thrive. He had to thrive. You see, we're in a really strange and scary time in our lives right now when the reality of how close we all are to death and how close our loved ones are to death has hit us really hard and really fast. But it's precisely in times like these that we're forced to live like Lazarus, to live like Lazarus, to remember just how precious each and every day of our lives is, and then to consider what we're going to do with them. So this week, this week, let's commit to thriving and not just surviving. Let's commit to thriving. Find those places in your lives that you can bury and resurrect, make new. So they're not frustrations anymore, but instead they're places of grace, resurrection life, resurrection life. Spend that extra bit of time with your kids. It's a thing I have to do myself, all right? Make this time a time for thriving and not just surviving. And do it because you know that you have the spirit of God within you where this resurrection life starts. You've got Jesus. Amen. God, we thank you. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for being the God who loves us, who brings us not only resurrection in the future, but resurrection right here and right now. We pray for all of our congregation, for our neighbors and our strangers around us, for our world, that you will be present, 
that you will bring more resurrection life into our midst, that you will help heal people's bodies and heal our minds, keep us safe and healthy and sane and serving. Give us this week wisdom on how to not just survive, but to thrive. We ask these things in the name of the one who rose again himself, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you all for joining me on this new way of doing church. Um, before I leave you, I'd like to uh, just mention, make two notes about worship uh, in the upcoming weeks. The first is this, that I ask you to remember to send me your prayers and your praises each week, hopefully by Friday night. Um, if you can do that, that would be uh, fantastic. I truly appreciate it. Um, and if you want, if you want, actually, this would be great. If you want to take a video of yourself uh, filming a short one, 10, 20 seconds or something like this, filming your prayer request. Uh, I, I think we might be able to get a number to be able to do something uh, pretty wonderful and community building in that uh, service next week. Um, so I encourage you to do that. Um, over these next couple of weeks, I'd also like us at one point to take communion together. We're coming upon Holy Week and Easter, perfect times um, to share in the Lord's Supper together. And since we'll all still probably be on lockdown during these weeks, I invite you, I invite you to go ahead and purchase a loaf of bread um, and a bottle of grape juice um, and set them apart. Make them sacred. If you have to freeze the bread, please freeze the bread just for the time. Set them apart. Make them sacred for when we can come together together, um, come together and, and celebrate the Lord's Supper together, this communion. I'll have you bring those out and then we will celebrate the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the resurrection life that he gives us uh, once again together um, through our worship service online. Um, I'll send a couple of reminders out this week um, and next week, uh, reminding us to buy these things and to send in these prayer requests. But until then, let me leave you with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. See you next week.